it's a continuation of committee discussion about S-254. I'll lead it off with a question. Um, we've heard an awful lot of testimony. Um, and <clears throat> one of the questions I guess would be, is there a problem? And then the second question is, if there is one, does S-254 help to solve that problem? Um, and my plan is to, after this morning, to take two weeks off, come back to it um, two weeks from today and see where we're at and perhaps work with Ben on some uh, redrafts of the bill. I don't know of any bill that we've passed recently that didn't have changes to it. So um, clearly there's been some good suggestions um, uh, for improvement. So I guess I will start with that question. Is there a problem? I think there is. Um, I, I, I think there is a problem. I don't know. Um, how we solve it, I think that the, well, I, I think that the way the courts currently are interpreting it might be um, less of a problem than potential courts might interpret. But I think for the most part, what I've heard is that for the most part, not in every case, they are um, applying it reasonably, but there should be some recourse for victims to um, be compensated. Okay. Well, I guess I'll jump in here. I don't tend to agree there's a problem. Um, we've heard about problems in the federal courts, but this is not something that's gonna resolve that particular problem. I've been really uncomfortable with the timing of this bill in the midst of everything else that is going on around us. I've been really loath to um, try to address something in circumstances where we've got so much going on around us. And one of the things that I've got to support the administration on is the optics at a time when we can't find people to get into law enforcement. Um, I am probably the only one on the screen right now who has actually experienced looking up the barrel of a shotgun held by a police officer. And that's what drove me to law school and it drove me eventually to politics and signing on to the expungement bill. I'm always sympathetic with the idea that people should be entitled to redress their um, problems with the police. And oddly enough, when I hear witnesses talking about this being a, a black versus white discussion and systemic racism, um, I will only say that Mike Sherling, when he was chief of police, was asked to begin taking data collection on uh, stops by his officers by my Human Rights Commission. And so I am sympathetic with causes, but I do not see this as a systemic racism issue at all. Nationally, I'm gonna use one example and that is George Floyd. I cannot imagine a more um, obvious case to talk about when it comes to this request for compensation. I totally disagree with Jay Diaz's characterization of this and I don't know whether he intended that or not, but the spin that was put on it was, this is an all or nothing situation. And it is definitely not. It is a question of which pocket you are actually attacking in order to try to get compensation. In the case of George Floyd, who is the most obvious example, um, Derek Chauvin is now in jail, probably will be for the remainder of his life. I call that, with respect to Derek Chauvin, justice. For the family of George Floyd, the Milwaukee City Council, I'm sorry, the Minneapolis City Council, 
gave that family $27 million as a result of the civil rights violation that took place. I don't know what other success the family could have against Derek Chauvin at this point in time because he has nothing else left to give. But again, we're talking about a federal situation and not a state situation. When I began the practice of law, the Vermont Supreme Court was beginning to spread its wings on the Vermont Constitution and made every attempt it could to demonstrate the distinction between the United States Constitution's uh, parameters and Vermont's Constitution and constantly began siding with Vermont Constitution's desire to broaden the scope of Vermont citizens who were having infractions um, and or not that's not the right word who were having conflicts in various ways with police officers. I cannot for the life of me believe that we need to have a statute in place to dictate to the Vermont Supreme Court what it should be doing in these circumstances. Qualified immunity is not blanket immunity, which is another beef I've had with some of the witnesses we've heard. Qualified immunity was not set up in a vacuum. It was set up to make sure it was a balancing test between what the courts deemed to be appropriate and not with respect to civil rights violations. Our Supreme Court, I have full faith in to resolve any issues that may arise as to somebody unfairly being deprived of compensation as a result of an obvious violation of their civil rights. Um, so I, I've, I've put all that together and I've come out and having to say, I just cannot support this bill. I don't need to pontificate any more about it, um, but that's been the position I've been struggling with all along. Um, I will pause to say I've been concerned about some of the testimony we've heard. Um, I just can't countenance people who seem to insult others. And when that happens, um, I go away after the committee discussion and I find myself very frustrated. Um, but I, I hope that my position on this does not lead to reactions from some of the witnesses we've heard, um, because I have to frankly say I'm, I'm really tired of getting um, hit from both the right and the left. I try my best to do what I can under circumstances, and um, I guess I will leave it at that. And I may be Joe, only against it, but that's that. Joe, do you? Thank you for your honesty. Um, Mr. Chair, Senator Bruce, go ahead, Bill. I'm just yeah. wondering, Joe, when you say um, insult other people, do you mean in our hearings that was going on or in email that you're getting? Yeah, I, I, I've heard some of our uh, witnesses disparage other witnesses. And, and I just, I'd rather not talk names because I think that's just going to exacerbate the situation. But I felt very uncomfortable when that was happening. And all of us deserve to uh, give each other respect, whether you're a witness or a committee member. And I think committee members certainly have learned how to do that very well. Um, but I was very uncomfortable with some of the testimony. And it almost got to the point where I just wanted to turn off my screen and walk away. Um, I hope that answers your question, Philip. It does. I'm. I'm uh, uh... I'll say it doesn't square with my experience of listening to the testimony. There was nothing that I would characterize as insults or, um, but I suppose it's different, different people, different perceptions. Um, I'll, I'll pick up about where I am. I, I wouldn't have co-sponsored this bill if I didn't believe that there was a problem. And I wouldn't have co-sponsored the bill if I didn't believe it was a, a good starting point for uh, a discussion about what kind of bill might fill that need. Um, so after hearing the testimony, that's still basically where I am. I'll, I'll just comment on the testimony we had today about insurance risk 
and, and risk pools generally. Um, some of my first experience in politics was as a school board commissioner in Burlington. And this was 20 years ago or so. And um, one thing that struck me was every, every time we wanted to make uh, a change, a reform in the way things were done, the, the last thing that we heard was a presentation from uh, our lawyers and our insurance people. And their advice was always essentially don't change anything because change produces risk. Risk is no good. Risk is uh, taxpayer money put at, at risk. And um, I understand that, but it's a, it's a mindset that is, um, you know, it's not just limiting, it's, you know, it stunts reform itself, change itself. So I, I respect all the professionals who gave their opinion about insurance today, but just to repeat something I said earlier, qualified immunity by definition is limiting the risk artificially for law enforcement agencies, uh, law enforcement officers and municipalities and states. And so they have enjoyed that artificial um, reduction of risk. So if that reduction of risk is a problem, by definition, it means we're gonna have to put a little more risk on those agencies, municipalities and the state itself, but it's in service of justice um, for victims who've had their constitutional rights and other rights violated. So, um, Whatever else we do, I hope we're not guided by uh, exclusively by the warnings of insurance people because I've never heard an insurance professional uh, get behind solid change because that's not where they make their bread and butter. So I am less, certainly less eloquent than either Joe or Phil, but I, I have, I've done a ton of reading on this issue and research and listened to everything and read everything that's been given to us. And I am very uncomfortable. And if I, if I can say um, that I, I share the um, thought that this was not a good time to do it because of the climate that we're in, I share that with Joe. And I know that we've been told the two things that first of all, surveys, show that the population really supports law enforcement. And, the, and I, I was sent, I think, four surveys today, and I read them during the break, and they're all national surveys. And they all, and, and I don't know that, they, that saying, yes, I support the police, it is um, reflected in the actions that communities are taking. And if you look at some of the um, actions in Burlington and Brattleboro, and they are not supportive in general of the of law enforcement. So I, I think that those surveys don't don't convince me that this is a climate that is supportive of law enforcement. And I so I'm nervous about that. I I just I will throw and I had a conversation. I know that the um, two of our Capitol Police officers will be retiring within the next year, probably. And so they're starting recruitment already and in anticipation of that. And people, what they've heard from people is, I'll just reserve my, um, my application until I find out what happens with this bill because I'm not gonna come to Vermont if if that so, I I can't talk about recruitment in general. I can just say that I know that this is already an issue for some places that are recruiting, and people have said, "I will not come to Vermont if this is passed." The other thing we've heard is that seventy five percent of Vermonters agree that qualified immunity should be um, repealed. I would say that of that seventy five percent. 80% of them don't even know what qualified immunity is or what the issues are with it. Because I receive tons of emails from people and those um, with whom I have some kind of a relationship, I have sent 
um, a note back and said, what, what, do you, what do you think qualified immunity is and what do you think the issues are with it and why should it, and they, they don't know for the most part, they don't know. So I, I think that um, I understand that we need to um, pay attention to our constituents, but I would posit that, that most of the constituents do not know what it is and the complexities of it. So um, the, I, I'm not basing any of my decision on 75% of the people um, support it, or um, so I'm trying to figure it out in the best way possible. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. I appreciate all three of you. Um, Senator Nitger, do you have any comment or would you like to withhold for this no. time? I do. I just would like to say that I think we've been moving in the right direction with all of the things we've been doing with police situations, training, et cetera. And I'm not sure, I mean, those things take time and to have an impact. And also um, one would think that, um, I mean, I, th I think this goes too far at this point in terms of allowing some things that we've passed already to get into place. Um, you know, certainly there are some situations that are terrible. Some of those situations, people have been able to um, sue and get money. I don't think getting money is the only thing of this. I mean, helping victims is what it's really all about, is the only help for victims getting money. I mean, certainly one of them. But I think, um, you know, I, a couple of the cases that did get to court and did okay, certainly deserve to. And the there are others, but I don't know that money money helps in all of that. But I think really what we're doing is a lot of the stuff to mitigate um, some of these situations happening, certainly education and training, and you know, just much more awareness of what one should not be doing. So sort of still mulling well, things over. Yeah, when I when yeah. I started it embarked on this. And first, you know, signed on to sponsor it, like Senator Baruth. I, I believe there is a problem. I think it's a gap in the access to justice um, for certain victims. And while it may not be as bad as in Vermont as it is in Tennessee, there's still, in my view, still a problem in the gap. Um, what I, I also um, I'm looking at Colorado's law. I'm looking at what did the Supreme Court mean by significant violations as opposed to, I suppose, less significant violations. Our Vermont Supreme Court, I mean, um, in the Zulo case. So that's an important statement. Mm -hmm. um, the legislature may provide and limit a statutory remedy for constitutionally based tort violations, as long as the remedy provides meaningful redress for significant violations. Absent legislation provided meaningful, me, meaningful remedy for constitutional tort violations. In the term, the scope and limits of sovereign immunity, we conclude that the judge made doctrine does not superside, supersede the right of the people to seek redress from the state for violations of fundamental constitutional rights. Now, I, I suspect they were talking when they say significant of fundamental constitutional rights. Um, regarding the idea that, you know, I can't tell you how many groups I've heard from that are having a hard time getting workers. Um, I don't think it's mm -hmm. limited to police. I think it's a national and statewide huge problem. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if even discussing this legislation is inhibiting, maybe for some people. But I think, you know, I think we have to recognize that um, the pandemic has created um, a shortage of workers in so many different areas, whether it be a restaurant, you know, I, CVS Farmers, or excuse me, Walgreens in Bennington closed at four in the afternoon because they couldn't get anybody to work. 
one day. Somebody called in sick and they didn't have enough workers to even keep the store open. Mm -hmm. So I don't, you know, I, I don't know how much impact discussing a bill has on recruitment. Um, maybe it has some. The other thing um, that I said was I would listen and I have listened. And I've been listening to now, there's not just two sides, but all sides on this issue. Mm. And I've tried to better understand where everybody is coming from, but it seems like mm. <clears throat> uh, for individual officers and for everyone, I don't think anyone wants frivolous lawsuits. And to the extent that this might create some frivolous lawsuits, I certainly don't want to be a part of that, too. So that's kind of where my feelings are at. I, I want to continue to look at this issue. Um, maybe scale back would be one way to um, get a majority vote. Um, and after all, it takes three votes to get a bill out. And... Uh, I, you know, goes without saying that I have great respect for people on who uh, people have talked from the Department of Public Safety, from state troopers to um, local police, uh, local officials. I also have great respect for the ACLU and and the folks that have spoken on that on their side. The, the the people who have come forward, some of them in law enforcement, who have suggested that this is a problem. Now, it may not be as widespread, may not be as much of a problem in Vermont, but if, if we can um, Senator Sears, I think you froze. They're on the I have, I have people working. Am I alive now? Or Yeah. Um, I, there are some people working on the lines out by the house. Oh. Uh, hopefully they won't leave any contaminated construction <laughs> material before the effective date of 166. But um, I think they might be affecting my internet. <laughs> Senator Baruth, did you want us to comment? Or? I was just going to say, keep Marley inside so she yeah. doesn't eat the... So he doesn't eat any contaminants that they might throw away. I don't know what they're doing there. They look like they're working on the house next door, Mike. There's two trucks out there. So Senator that may Sears. be why my internet's yeah. I'm I'm not an attorney. And um, so I don't understand a lot of the differences between common law ca case law. I know that that's common law is case law. Case law is common law. I think, and I don't understand tort liability. I'm not an attorney, but I was really compelled by one of the things that Dan Richardson said in terms of the breadth of this bill. And he was talking about tort liability and I, I'm not, so the two examples that he, and so the Supreme Court talked about a significant violation and he talked about the the two examples, one was the DUI versus the domestic violence and which, which should the officer go to. And the other one was a, around the closure of a road for icy conditions. And if the officer made the decision to close a road and somebody couldn't get out um, because of the closure, were, would they be able to sue the law enforcement officer for that decision? Or conversely, that he didn't close the road and somebody was killed on it. And what he said was that it, if, if this was, if tort liability was, or common law was, all of these were um, included in the bill, that in that case, the uh, law enforcement officer would not be able to um, use his best judgment or qualified immunity, but the public works department employee, if he had made the decision, he would be able to, to use it because he has qualified immunity. So I am, I'm just really concerned about, 
and he what he talked about was what are the hard decisions and that might be the same thing that you were pointing out in the in the Zulo case where they were talking about significant violations as opposed to but this under this bill my under the way he presented it is that this would be swept into that so i, I yeah well i i think ben is here to to give us a, help us kind of a lesson yeah well ben? And yeah, thank you, Senator Sears. And Senator White, to that point, if I recall correctly about what Mr. Richardson was saying is that there, there are different analyses for the different types of wrongs, right? So we've talked about the constitutional torts, which Zulo talks about, um, but he was referring to negligence. And currently, those negligence claims are made against the state under the Vermont Tort Claims Act, which is exempted from this statute it would the provisions of that would not apply and when he was talking about discretionary functions that's a specific exemption under that law and so the analysis that would be undertaken is one that's derived from that so it's it's kind of and i know it's confusing because this confuses it could be lawyers and non-lawyers but there are different the different analyses that go on and so I think in that case, it wouldn't this this bill would not apply to those sort of discretionary functions because these go towards the discretionary function exemption is something that is afforded to the Vermont Tort Claims Act it is not a part of this analysis that would happen. And I, I think what this bill is attempting to do is to create a uniform standard for various violations that are not touched by other statutes. So is that what, thank you, Ben, is that what on page line, page two, that, the, those lines completely confuse me because I don't have a clue what they mean. And that's what you're, so what it says is this, is, this bill wouldn't be subject to common law doctrines of immunity. What does that even mean? Well, common law and, and I think what I've taken from this is that this is an area to, to clarify um, as far as, and, and I think a simple change to these do not apply to actions under the section would maybe be a way to change it. Um, but the common law doctrines of immunity, the intent behind that was absolute immunity, qualified immunity. And I know today there was discussion about the good faith affirmative defense and that being an immunity. Now, there may be different trains of thought on this, but an affirmative defense is not an immunity. It can include an immunity like qualified immunity. Um, I know it's confusing, um, but specifically talking about chapter 189 of this title, so subdivision three there, yeah. that's the Vermont Tort Claims Act. So this section is saying that it's not subject so the provisions of that, of the Vermont Tort Claims Act does not apply to actions brought under this. And the discretionary function exception is part of chapter 189. So what do one and two mean? So one and two means says subdivision one is an attempt to say that absolute immunity and qualified immunity are not defenses to liability in this. So there, this, the, an action brought under this section those cannot be, can be used. And then the statutory immunities and limitations and liability are what we had talked about before about, um, uh, and it could be overly inclusive as well, as far as the Vermont Tort Claims Act, the municipal equivalent, but also the provisions about insurance waivers of immunity, because there are statutes that say um, qualify or immunity is waived uh, to the extent that you've purchased an insurance policy. Uh, so it would, that's designed to cover those statutes as well. It's just to say that the liability standards that we create here, the damages standards that we create under this law, it are what are what's to apply when an action is brought. So number one says that absolute immunity or qualified immunity cannot be used as a defense. Correct. Okay. So. <laughs> 
So we are eliminating absolute immunity and qualified immunity for everyone, not just for law enforcement officers. No, it would just be for law enforcement officers because that's who the action could be brought against. And admittedly, I, it would probably be a rare occurrence where absolute immunity would be used as a defense uh, because most law enforcement officers are not in the position of like a commissioner or uh, a legislator. Um, and it would only be if they were acting pursuant to their authority as a law enforcement officer. So I, I guess I don't understand the construct of C because it says that one and two don't, can't be used, but three and four are not even affected by this bill. So I don't, I don't under, that's. Well, it means that they can't be used in this as well. They're separate and apart. And that's the intent. And again, I think that as I go back and uh, work through my markup, this is an area to clarify, um, and and that and that's something that I will I will make clear. Okay. All right. Thanks. I I I do apologize for being so dense, but I I well, just I don't, think, I don't think you're done. I think it's very the testimony from both sides has left a lot of confusion in our minds. Um, and um, frankly, um, it, I, I'm not sure if, I, I don't think it was by design, but, and, no. and Ben, I have a question for you. So. Yes, Senator Sears. It's an icy night. A car overturns. The police um, come to investigate and the driver of the vehicle um, is a little unsteady. So they decide he might be driving while under the influence. So they take him to a police station and try to find a drug recognition expert on this icy night. But one is not available in the immediate area. So they have to wait to get one from somewhere else. And that person, you know, it's about an hour later. And um, the drug recognition expert comes in and says there's no evidence of drug driving. But evidently, there was evidence of a concussion. And nobody treated that. Is, where would that stand with this qualified immunity? So, Senator Sears, are you asking if they continued to hold this person because they had a concussion? Is that sort of well? They continued to ex uh, believe he was in he was intoxicated. Well, uh, the the short answer is, <laughs> I mean, I don't know exactly in that situation because I, I guess I'm struggling to figure out exactly what you're asking. Is as far as well, would this be a case where a where qualified immunity under current law would come in. And um, this was an actual case. And I, what he was really seeking was an apology from the officers, but. Um, well, I, I suppose, I mean, the effect of this is to essentially put law enforcement officers in the shoes of everyday people, as far as what the liability um, that they're exposed to. And so if there was a claim that this individual had against the police officer, you know, either for negligence, um, that he had a duty to this person during the scope of while he was lurking as a law enforcement officer and somehow breached that duty and it caused him harm, theoretically, yes, this person could bring an action against the law enforcement officer. And he would not be able to use qualified immunity in that situation. If this passed. Correct. But if it, if it, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Other comments, questions? Um, so one other. Ben, yeah, go ahead, Alice. Um, 
one of the other recommendations to, you know, to do something to perhaps mitigate something happening in the future was to um, do like Jeanette's committee is looking at and look at licensing of police officers. We already, we already do that. And there is um, under the new criminal justice council, just for your information, there is a um, new a subcommittee made up of professional of uh, subcommittee of professional regulation and discipline. Mm -hmm. And it is co-chaired by Sheriff Mark Anderson and Susanna Davis. They co-chair the committee and they are um, working really hard to make sure that um, in this environment, we know that it's hard to, it, it took them a while to get organized, the crim mm -hmm. new criminal justice council, because we added like 15 members but they are working on that. And so there is, there is that work going on. Mm -hmm. And they are currently not a, a licensed, certified um, under the um, level one, level two and level threes. And um, so, yeah, that is happening. Um, anything else? All right, why don't we uh, meet here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m.?